So any questions? We'll be having like uh, mini quizzes as we go along. Uh, not worth that many points, but cumulatively we'll add up. All right, so uh, we, we went through hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium so far. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at some of the other atoms. You know, uh, after um, beryllium comes boron, And then, do you know what? After boron, carbon. Carbon's one of the most important ones um, because it's due to, let me see. It's due to the uh, way carbon attaches to other atoms. You know, the way it can bond is, is, uh, is varied. And therefore, you know, when, when we look at carbon, um, carbon gets its own class of chemistry. Now, chemistry is subdivided into inorganic chemistry, organic chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. Well, organic chemists, they specialize in um, carbon compounds, carbon-containing compounds. And that's because it, the carbon chemistry is so rich. It's not just graphite. You know, graphite's made of pure carbon, or diamond. Diamond's also made of pure carbon. So we got boron, carbon, and then after carbon comes nitrogen, which is number seven. Um, nitrogen is very important, uh, although, you know, the air, you know what? The air we breathe in consists mostly of oxygen or Nit nitrogen. nitrogen. It's close to 80% nitrogen, and so we're inhaling nitrogen. Is nitrogen important? We're light. I mean, yeah. Well, the air, from the air that we breathe in. No, nitrogen really doesn't do much. Uh, in fact, nitrogen's the oxygen, of course, is important. Nitrogen. Um, after nitrogen comes oxygen, and then. Fluorine. Now, uh, fluorine is common. Common error with fluorine is people misspell it. You know, they they spell it uh, like flour. It's not like flour, like baking flour. It's um, F L U. Oh. So, watch out for that. It's F L U, not F L O. And then after fluorine comes neon. So you need to just memorize the the symbols and the names for these. Now, um, let's take a look at what happens to the, to the size of these, just as a general trend. Um, so, now, somebody asked me if they should memorize the numbers. No, don't, you don't have to bother memorizing the numbers for this. But we should just take a look at what's happening with the size. When we, when we're starting off. You know, let's start off at lithium, which we covered yesterday, and then uh, BE, which stands for beryllium, and then go on to boron. What's happening to the size of the atom? It's decreasing. They're, they're decreasing. So this is a pattern or the trend we're just looking at. There's a decrease. Like I said earlier, you know, if you're if you're really trying to quantify it, that is, you know, put that into hard numbers. What you do is you look for some kind of mathematical equation. Maybe it's decreasing by 10% each, or maybe it's decreasing by a certain amount, or maybe, you know, that would be what we call linear trend. A linear trend is like a straight line trend, but it doesn't have to be linear. It could be non-linear, or it's curved, but I don't know. But the trend is, just roughly what the trend is, is it just shrinks down. So that's something we want to understand later, you know. Uh, but if we came up with some kind of mathematical equation or mathematical formula, then we can make certain predictions, you know, about what's going to happen to the size trend. You know, we can maybe sort of extrapolation. We can extrapolate out, or we can interpolate between, you know, points to see how things things do. Those are things we can do mathematically. But but that really, you know, if we define this by some law, the law of the shrinking atom, then. Um, it doesn't really get into a deeper fundamental uh, description of what's going on. Uh huh. Well, what is the size of the 
Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Because uh, yeah. Why does the size reduce? Why does the size reduce? That's exactly, um, you know, that's part of the scientific method because here, first you look at the observations, right? And then you see some kind of pattern and you go, huh, what's going on with that pattern? Then you try to quantify that pattern. You quantify that pattern by using mathematics and try to make it into a, you know, first comes the observation, then comes the pattern, and then comes the law. the law. The law is if you can get a consistent pattern that works repeatedly, then we call it a law. Otherwise, we call it a we call it a rule. You know, maybe that's the rule. So what we do is once we get it once we get it down to the point where okay, this is the pattern. I have the pattern down. You know, I can you know predict how it's going to go. Then we start thinking about why is it shrinking. You know what's you know what's the uh, root cause of the, the, sh the you know and then we start to hypothesize hypothesize you know what a hypothesis is it's kind of a guess to as to what the uh, fundamental uh, reason or the, the the description the fundamental description of why it's shrinking down and so yesterday we, we had two hypotheses one hypothesis was that. Uh, something about the electrons. If you don't know about the structure of the atom, the atoms consist of some electrons in there and the electrons being pulled in closer, or it's about the room. You know, if you have this room, you know, of strangers, right, versus the room of friends, well, something's causing the friendliness to increase because the friendliness increases quite a lot because, you know, fluorine is a much more um, heavier atom. There's a lot more matter inside that. And so what's causing all that matter to come closer together and, and tighter, you know? And so this is what, th what comes next is the hypothesis. And so, um, and, and the, the reason is, is, is because of, um, of another law. <laughs> the reason is, is, this is chemistry. Chemist Chemists aren't really, uh, you know, like uh, Newton's, uh, like gravitational. The chemists don't really worry about gravitational pull or that kind of stuff. You know, what chemists worry about is um, electrical, what we call electrical forces. Electrical forces are dictated by Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law is just a mathematical equation that describes the electrical forces. <coughs> Coulomb's law says that the force of attraction or repulsion and I'm just going to um, use this because I'm not going to write out the full Coulomb's law. We just need, we aren't going to do any calculations with Coulomb's law. But so Coulomb's law is... Something, yeah. This, uh, that would be the charge on yeah. it. But, but uh, you know, the charge, y yes, the charge varies, but, um, you know, it's, it, it depends on not just, the, in physics you treat it like, if you, if you had physics, when you're dealing with Coulomb's law, you treat the charges as what you call point charges. Yeah. In one point in space, you have that full charge. In chemistry, it's spread out over a volume. And that volume is not necessarily spherical volume. The volume depends on a bunch of other things, which we'll talk about later. And so the charge might not be minus or plus 1.67 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It might not be that. It could be a different charge. And so what, whatever that charge is, well, in this case it would be, but the charge is given by Q. This is the charge on um, A and then QB. This is the charge on B. And so if we have a, a particle or a, uh, something, you know, A has a charge of, of this, B has a charge of this, you know, how strongly are they going to be attracted or how strongly are they going to be repelled from each other? Well, it, it's going to depend on how strongly the charge they are, the more charge they are. This is like electrostatic, um, you know, shock. You know, the greater the charge you carry, the, the greater your uh, shock will be. And then it also depends on the distance, you know, how far apart they are. Um, but the distance is nonlinear. And so it's going to be the distance between the center of charges squared. The center of the charge just means, you know, 
if you have an odd sh you know charge distribution like this, it'd be right right in the center. Are you in this class? Yeah, I'm the kids at there. Oh, this full, sorry. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's no room, and we, I have a wait list. Yeah, I'm on the waiting list. You're on the waiting list? Yeah. Were you here yesterday? No. Oh. Yeah, that's the that's, uh, that's problem. Um, but uh, you can check the other classes. You can just write your name on uh, here. Let's see. But, uh, All right, and so we have the charge on A and the charge on B in the distance between the center of charges squared. And so uh, the way that this, this boils down, this is why the size of the atom is kind of important. Remember what I said about beryllium? Does anybody remember what I said about beryllium? It, it's highly uh, poisonous. And, um, okay. Um, and so the, the thing is, um, what we have here, and th this is it, when, um, when you're drinking like uh, milk or something and you're getting some calcium, are you drinking calcium atoms? Uh, technically not. What you're drinking are calcium, what we call ions. Ions are atoms that have a, a, a charge on them. And so, for example, calcium 2 plus, this is how you read it, is a calcium atom with a 2 plus charge. We'll talk about the charges a little bit later. But um, anyway, take a look at what happens to the size. The size shrinks down. It's a lot smaller. This is what's in blue here. And so if we look at the calcium ion, it, it's 100 picometers, 2 plus charge. Magnesium 2 plus is 72 picometers plus charge. Take a look at beryllium. Beryllium 2 plus is 27 picometers with a 2 plus charge. Now let's let's have a negative species here. And so I'm going to just put a negative ball here like this. Okay. And then I, I have a, a positive 2 plus ball over here. And so this is, um, we, we write it like this, rather than saying plus two, it's two plus. And rather than saying um, minus one, or one minus. I don't know why, but this is convention. So eventually you get used to it. All right, and so here, I have different size two plus balls. And so, uh, for example, beryllium is a very small two plus ball, like this. And then I have a negative one ball, so these are just balls. You know, they could be whatever, a fifth balls, cotton balls, whatever. Okay, there's going to be an attraction. That attraction is going to be with a Q, QA will be two, QB will be one. Now, if QA were one, let's say if this were a one plus ball rather than a two plus ball, then I'm, I'm going to expect half the force. Now, if they're opposites, they attract. And so opposites, that is opposite charge, attract. Like charges, repel. OK, these are opposite charges, so they're going to attract each other. And so if this were a 1 plus ball and a 1 minus ball, the force of attraction would be half. This is a two plus ball and one minus ball, we're gonna have double the attraction. If this were a two plus ball and a two minus ball, what would happen to the attraction? It would quadruple, I mean it'd be four times. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And so it's going to depend on the charge, which we'll learn uh, more about later, and it's gonna depend on the, the side. Because if this is a beryllium, beryllium is 27, and then um, magnesium is about three times bigger. And so magnesium would be something like this. It's still two plus, but since it's three times bigger, the attraction is going to be a lot weaker because the distance now is farther. The farther apart the balls are, the weaker the attraction. 
And so you can spread them out. If you get them infinitely far apart, there's no attraction, basically. The attraction's going down to zero. And so with a, um, with, okay, this would be beryllium with a two plus charge. This would be magnesium with a two plus charge. And then calcium, calcium is uh, 190, uh, I mean 100, so it's a, it's a little bit bigger. And so calcium, the center of the calcium would be here, I'd say. This would be calcium. So you can see the strongest, what we call coulombic or electrostatic attraction, the strongest electrical attraction is going to be with beryllium. And this is what causes beryllium to be so troublesome. Is of course, we need magnesium, we need calcium for our bodies to function, but if beryllium gets in there, it really gets stuck. It doesn't let go. It's like a, uh, something that bites into it and won't. Whereas maybe calcium, you know, the magnesium is going to have a weaker attraction. Sometimes you want the weaker attraction. Sometimes you want the stronger attraction. It's like, you know, um, of course we need oxygen in air, but if we have a lot of carbon monoxide, then it doesn't matter how much oxygen we have in the air, you're still going to suffocate. Why? It's a poisonous gas. It's a poisonous gas. And the room could be filled with 20% oxygen, but if you have a lot of carbon monoxide, you're still going to die from asphyxiation. That is, asphyxiation, not enough oxygen. So there's plenty of oxygen, it's still the oxygen in the room hasn't changed, right? And so why is carbon monoxide going to asphyxiate you? Uh -huh. to the receptors. Right, because uh, you know, in, in your blood you have hemoglobin, and oxygen uh, yeah, attaches to the hemoglobin, and it, it's a loose connection there, so it breaks off easily. But when carbon monoxide comes in, it's stuck on there and won't let go. If it's stuck on there and won't let go, then oxygen can't get to your hemoglobin, and you're going to die from... So it makes you sleepy? It's going to make you sleepy, and then uh, you're going to die. <laughs> if you if you don't you know get some you know. no because uh, like instead of oxygen you breathe that so then you just no you're breathing oxygen oh. it's a competition oh, right. it's a competition then and this is in chemistry it's a competition oxygen versus carbon monoxide carbon monoxide wins beryllium versus calcium beryllium is going to win why because a stronger attractive force. That's why. Wouldn't the gases equalize though and separate? So your oxygen would be at the bottom of the room. So I'm sorry? Wouldn't isn't CO two heavier? Or no. Oxygen's heavier than CO two, correct? No. It's the other way. No, it's the other way. Because I know but isn't CO two bribed for the oxygen rises. And if you combine the two well, gases and Okay, that that's due to gravitational. You know, things that sink down are due to gravitational. Okay, the, the thing is, gravity is kind of a weak force for, like oxygen, uh, the question is, is, doesn't the CO2 sink down and the oxygen rise? Um, well, what's the difference? Well, when we think about oxygen that we breathe, oxygen that we breathe is called O2. And O2 consists of two oxygen atoms that are bonded together. So this is one oxygen atom. Actually, I'll just show you. Uh, this is one way of showing it. Um, structure. There are different ways that we represent the uh, oxygen. This is what we call space filling. So, do you see? You know, if these were hard shells, then the two hard shells would come right at the edge, right? But do you see how the two shells are being pulled into each other, making it appear the atoms appear a little smaller? they are and that's because they aren't hard shells you know they're kind of like nerf ball type things where you can, they can come together like this kind of like, hmm? like what yeah right um, it, it, they aren't hard shells so this is why they kind of push into each other like this okay. when we figure out what the radius of the oxygen is we figure out the radius by taking the distance between the centers and dividing it by two. So when I look at the radius of the oxygen atom, this is the radius of the oxygen atom here. But when you look at that, well, that doesn't quite cover. See, and so this is why we say about, we don't say exactly, you know, the radius. But anyway.
anyway, this is kind of what an oxygen looks like. You have oxygen, they like to color red, even though oxygen is colorless, right? They don't, they don't turn red atoms, but they just give a color coding to the atoms. But so we got two oxygen atoms put together. Now, these are strongly stuck together. And although um, the oxygen atoms are not charged here, what holds them together are electrical, a coulombic attraction. We call it electrostatic forces or what holds them together. But anyway, we got O2. Now each oxygen weighs about how much? Can you tell me about how much a, an oxygen weighs? Okay, uh, what we do, um, when I ask you this question, this is how I answer it. You, you probably saw this pattern um, perhaps earlier. See where I put that. Sure. Where I see that is here. Yeah. I look at this number here. Um, we'll talk about this number more later. But this tells us that the oxygen weighs around 16U. You don't say it's going to be 15999 because that number is going to come from something else, but it's going to be approximately 16 units. You know, the, whereas hydrogen, so an oxygen atom weighs 16 times more than a hydrogen atom, roughly. It turns out that there are, in nature, do you know how many different, um, you know, all the oxygen atoms are the same except they aren't the same because some oxygens weigh more than other oxygens. And so, um, do you know how many different uh, masses of oxygen atoms there are? And you know what? I, I made a mistake yesterday. It's not called an isotope. It's called an allotrope. I, I was thinking isotope because I heard isotope on the radio some things. Or uh, not out. Oh no, I was I was right. Isotope. I, I screwed it up in the afternoon, maybe. But anyway. Um, these are what we call the stable. And so every time you breathe in oxygen, you're, you're breathing in oxygen 16, which weighs about 16U. You're breathing oxygen 17, which weighs 17U. And you're breathing oxygen 18, which weighs about 18U. Not exactly, but about. And so you're breathing in different oxygen. Now, what happens in nature is, um, like ozone. You know, ozone is produced in LA, in the LA basin, as part of photochemical smog. Right? If there's a lot of ozone in the air and the air is really smoggy, your eyes burn, right? your, your skin is irritated, your lungs burn from the ozone in the air. Have you ever, on a really smoggy day, felt that burn? I don't know. Uh, air quality's gotten a lot better, but I remember years ago when the air was very bad. And so ozone is three oxygens linked together like this. This is O3 ozone. Now, there's also the ozone layer. Did you hear about the ozone layer? Yeah. Yeah, obviously, because that's what protects us from the UV, right? Did you know that you can tell you can tell if the ozone came from the ozone layer or if the ozone came from sea level, around sea level. Do you know how? You can tell the difference? How you can tell the difference is this. The ozone that's produced around sea level is going to be richer in the 17 and 18. Whereas the ozone that's produced in the ozone layer is going to be richer in O16. And due to the percentage of O16 in the ozone layer versus the percentage of O16 at sea level, you can tell where the ozone came from. This is, this is a topic that geologists love. Uh, this is called isotopic fractionation. With isotopic fractionation, you could do a lot of different things, like determine origins and this type of stuff by looking at. People do this for paintings. You know, they want to know, you know, because there's slight differences in the fractions of the heavier ones and the lighter ones that they can determine the origins of certain things. Like this was quarried from this mine in Europe or wherever else, right? And so this is uh, uh, just slight differences in, in this. Um, but 
in this room, you know, it, it, you know, this, okay, if this weighs about, uh, what did I say, 16, and this weighs about 16, then this is going to be about 32, because 16 and 16 gives us around 32 U. Now, CO2 is going to consist of a, a, of a carbon atom and an oxygen. What's bigger, carbon or oxygen? Yeah, oxygen's smaller. And so we put the carbon in, not much smaller, just a little bit smaller. The carbon in the center, the carbon weighs about how much? 12.12. Yeah, yeah, those numbers we gotta talk about more. But just we're gonna just say approximately 12U. The oxygen's gonna be approximately 16U. And so this thing weighs 44U. And so CO2 is heavier than oxygen. If CO2 is heavier than oxygen, shouldn't it sink to the floor of the room? And the, the, in a room this size, the gravitational pull, the, the difference in mass is too small to really impact it. We need huge distances to impact it, like kilometers worth of distance. Then you'll see fractionation, like in ozone. But here, you aren't going to see it. I mean, it's going to be pretty evenly distributed in the room because gravi gravitational force is so weak. Okay. So the, the, uh, the original question was, wouldn't the heavier one sink to the floor and the lighter one rise? Um, not in this case, because of molecules. Now, now we have other things like, um, we have other things that rise to the floor and other things that sink to the bottom. Like, for example, if we had um, ether, have you heard of ether? Ether, uh, the, there's a, you know, very, very famous fires. Ether, ether fires strike fear in people. Ether, they used to, this was in the drug trade, they used to use ether to, uh, to I think, um, help purify cocaine or something, free-based cocaine. I don't know exactly what that involved, but, but basically they use ether, and when you open the cap on ether, you can see the vapors come off the top. And what happens is those vapors come off the top, go down to the table, and then the vapors fall off the table and then start filling the room. And so ether burns from the floor up. And so if there's an ether fire, it's very, very bad. And chemists are very aware of ether because ether is a very common solvent that's used in lots of organic chemistry for purification, for reactions, for whatever else. Whereas if you had something like a very volatile alcohol or gasoline, the vapors rise up. And so the fires that burn from the ceiling down are a lot safer than the fires that burn from the floor up. And so in th those cases, things do sink down, things do rise, but that's a little different than molecules. I mean, uh, these, uh, these things. Anyway, in nature, um, this is this is what we see. You know, they, they figured out how much. You know, these are very rare. O seventeen and O eighteen are rare. Cumulatively, they comprise only 0.24 percent of the oxygen that you breathe. You know, some of the oxygen molecules that you breathe are going to be heavier than others, but that difference in weight is so so small. You know, most of the oxygen that you're going to breathe is weighs 32 U roughly. It's very rare. Well, um, since we're talking about the, this, um, let's, uh, let's just finish up these last elements here. We just want to take a look at the size trend. So when we're looking at the size trend, we start off at lithium, which is about 155. Usually when, when, when I try to memorize the trends, if I have to memorize the trend, I look at the extremes. I don't memorize each number. And so what I do is I look at what, what's the extreme on the large size, 155. The extreme on the small side is 60. So it goes from about 155 to 60, which means it, it trumped by about more than half. And so, I, you know, that, that's enough. But the actual numbers you don't necessarily need. 
you just want to know, it starts off kind of big here, it's going to be about half the size, or less than half the size. Of the well, that means you only need one, you know, if you remember lithium is about 150, not that I'm going to ever ask you the sizes, but, uh, but just um, learning to recognize patterns and trends is an important part of science. But, uh, recognizing patterns and trends has a name in science, um, in the scientific method. In the scientific method, the name of uh, this type of stuff is called data reduction. Since we're talking about the scientific method, about data reduction. Data reduction, you could read about it. So you got lots of data, you got lots and lots of numbers. Do you want to memorize those numbers, rote memorization? No, not at all. You want to reduce all those numbers you know, sometimes you get thousands of numbers. You want to reduce all those numbers into the most concise definition you can. The most concise definition you can is a mathematical equation. If you have a mathematical equation that can define all those thousands of numbers, then you don't have to know any of those numbers, except maybe the extremes, right? And that's data reduction. But sometimes we don't, sometimes we'll just graph it. Sometimes we'll do other things to reduce all that data into something a lot simpler and a lot easier to digest. So this is a huge topic in the scientific method, data reduction. Um, and uh, data reduction is just getting the patterns and trends down you know, to a law, hopefully. All right, so, um, but what we do here is this. You know, we just try to visualize it. So if this is a boron atom, the neon is going to be like, like this. And then this is kind of the smooth trend going down. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at matter now. Even though neon's going to be the heaviest of all those, you know, um, neon's around 20, 20 U, you know, 20 times heavier than um, than hydrogen. Um, still going to be the smallest out of that series from lithium to neon. And so uh, matter is the physical material of the universe. So we'll, th that's everything, basically. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, subcategorize it. We're going to look at matter in, in more, more depth. Right? I told you all matter is made up of, of the um, atoms. And so let's take a look at um, how we're going to divide matter up. And so we have atoms, and we have different types of atoms, right? So the atoms are going to be um, either, um, you know, high, actually we have how many about? We have, you know, 100, did I say 110 plus? Is that okay? Uh, according to this, the, what's the biggest that you see there? 118, the biggest number? Yep. 118. All right, let's, let me take a look at this one. You know, 110, 120, this one goes to 118. There's actually more. Somebody got something in here already. And so this is old. You say about 110, 120, something like that. And so that's all the matter um, on Earth for sure. In the universe, there's going to be a lot more, you know, what we call subatomic particles. You know, some of these atoms break apart into smaller pieces. You'll see smaller particles pieces. But when the atom breaks apart into small pieces, like for example, if you take a copper atom and you try to break it up into smaller pieces, it's no longer copper. You know, the subatomic particles are just different things. So um, here we got the atoms. Now, um, these atoms can make substances. Now, what, let me talk about a substance. A substance is, um, 
long as we use some of the uh, pure there, but all substances are pure. That is this. Pure means they have a fixed composition. You know, you can't not change the composition. Fixed composition and properties. There's two types of substances that we deal with. We deal with the elements and we deal with compounds. And so the world is going to be made up of elements and compounds. The elements are just the, you know, the, the type of atoms. So for example, um, if we look at gold, gold gets the symbol AU uh, for orium, which I think is Latin for gold, orium, AU. Um, what we see is we see the gold atoms, and the gold atoms are, are packed together. They are bonded, you know, the gold atoms are actually attached together one another. So if you have a piece of gold, then there are a whole bunch of gold atoms uh, put together in, in that piece of gold. And so it looks something like this. You know. There are different ways of representing the gold structure. You now people look for uh, more mathematical ways of, of defining this. This is one of them. You know, they put a cube there and see how the gold atoms are arranged relative to the position in the cube. This is another way of representing it. These, these lines, you know, don't exist. These lines are just showing how things are attached to one another. You know? But they're representing what we call a bond. The bond in gold, this cube is not representing a bond, however. This cube is just trying to define this structure mathematically. So those lines don't But eventually, these gold atoms bond together to form a solid gold crystal like this. Here's an image the gold um, here. Here's a model of the gold structure. You see a whole bunch of these. Uh -huh. Is it a crystalline structure? It is a crystalline structure. This is what we call, um, when we get to crystal structures, this is very common. A lot of crystalline structures can be re represented by a cube. And this cube keeps re repeating like a brick. You, you can build a gold crystal by just adding a whole bunch of bricks together. This is called the unit cell. So this is a very crystalline structure. The bond here is very interesting. These golds are well, bonded together by metallic bonds. It's, it's not easy, you know, to, to break gold. Gold has a fairly high melting point as well. You know, to melt something, you got to break all the bonds and stuff like that. But here's some gold. In fact, it's really hard to break the bonds in gold. Um, take a look at this. Uh, it's pretty interesting. I just saw this here on this dynamic periodic table. Let's go back to gold. Gold is uh, 79. Gold is a really heavy atom, though. You know, gold weighs around 200 U, 200 times heavier. Just a single atom of gold is 200 times heavier, roughly, than, than hydrogen. It's a very heavy atom. But um, gold, those bonds are really, you know, you could hammer the heck out of gold. This is, this is a pretty impressive image. A gold nugget, five millimeters in diameter. Do you, see, you can barely see that. Let me turn off the light. Here. You see they have a tiny gold nugget there, five millimeters in diameter, and they hammered it into this huge sheet here. And so that's, that, that tiny chunk of gold can make a sheet of gold like this, gold foil. And that's the, the bonds don't want to break, because usually you hammer things, and the bonds start to break, and it starts to fall apart. If you take a, a, a salt crystal and take a hammer to the salt crystal, do the bonds remain intact? No, all the, you know, the, the atoms are going to break apart you know, if you start hammering that. But here they don't. They don't want to break apart. So these bonds are pretty pretty good bonds that, that hold it together, so I could just hammer it. In fact, you can hammer the gold into a sheet of atoms one layer thick. It's amazing. It's called a monolayer. Gold monolayers are not that difficult to make, and people make them all the time. Just to, can you imagine a, a sheet? Uh, just um, we, we use computers? Um, is there a 
conductor. Yeah, gold, <coughs> gold is an excellent conductor. Uh, they use them in computers because um, <coughs> of another property of gold. The other property of gold is it's really hard to oxidize gold. You know, if, if you made the, the connector in your computer out of copper, what happens is the copper starts to corrode. And as it corrodes, it makes some um, corrosion products which aren't good electrical conductors. So gold is what we call um, very stable. It's very hard to corrode. Therefore, and then it, then you think, wow, how can they, how can they coat your, you know, if you look at a USB cable, how can they coat it with gold, you know, and even this um, Cat5 connector here, you know, you look at that, that's gold plated. And, uh, you know, it must be worth a lot of money. Well, not really because there's so little gold. I mean, you don't need much gold to protect it. All right, so that's gold. But, you know, not all, all, uh, not all elements are like that because um, this is what we call solid. And to indicate that it's a solid, we put an S here and then something like that. And so most metals are solid. We, we have liquid mercury, which is uh, a liquid here. But, um, but this is different than carbon. You know, if we look at carbon, C, then there are actually, there are um, different forms of carbon that we see in nature. We see graphite. Yeah. Um, graphite is 100% carbon, this is pure carbon. The bonds in graphite are a little different though. And so let's just take a look at some graphite here. Um, this looks like coal. This doesn't look like a good crystal of graphite. Um, let me see if I have a good crystal of graphite. It looks like like a coal consists of a lot of um, graphitic carbon, but um, the crystal of graphite is really interesting. Let's see if I have a single crystal. This is more of what it looks like, crystals of graphite. That's because of the way the graphite atoms are put together, you know, the way they attach. Um, graphite uh, forms little sheets of uh, layers like this. So these are like hexagonal kind of, and so I'll just draw lines attaching the, the atoms. The atoms are all, you know, touching together. And so they, they, they aren't spaced apart. The atoms are actually overlapping here. You, know, you don't really see it because we want to clearly show how they're all connected here, connected here. Like this. And so this is solid. And you get these sheets of graphite like that. And these sheets are just stacked one on top of the other. So you can just have a single sheet of graphite. The, if you could just scrape all the other layers off. So it gives it, graphite uses a, as a lubricant, a high pressure lubricant, high temperature lubricant. One, high temperature because, you know, these bonds are, are what's holding the atoms together are bonds, what we call them. These bonds are fairly strong, so it's resistant to breaking, even with high temperature. Graphite's also hard to oxidize. But um, these sheets aren't held together by bonds. These heat sheets are just sitting on top of them. They can slide. So high temperature, high pressure. Whereas diamonds aren't like that. I mean, diamonds would have a totally different way of connecting. Let's take a look at diamond. Diamonds, like graphite, are highly crystalline. Also, highly crystalline um, versus something that's non-crystalline, I'll, I'll talk about in a second. You can 
can see a diamond crystal there on the right. If we look at the structure of, of diamond, you know how the um, atoms of, of diamond are, are, are bonded together. To give such nice crystals like that, um, the, the pattern like this. The cube is just to give the simplest representation of diamond there, call that a unit cell. And so you could build bigger crystals of diamond just by putting these cubes together, like building blocks. But you can see the arrangement is quite a bit different. And when you extend out the structure, it looks something like this. Again, uh, just the atoms are bonded together. So we have diamond, which is also a solid. Um, for these, like gold, you know, how big of a piece of gold you want, well, it just depends on how big you have. How small of a piece, you know, whatever. Is there a distinct size, like, of gold? No. I can have however big or however small, it, it just has to be in multiples of an atom. So I can add an atom, add another atom, take away an atom, take away an atom, although it's hard to take away a single atom. You can do that. And so this is what we call, uh, what we call a, um, should we call this? You know, the structure is what we call lattice type structure. And this lattice type structure just keeps going on and on. You know, there's no beginning, there's no end. Well, the beginning is one atom, the end is infinite number of atoms. You know, if you had enough gold, you could build an infinitely large crystal of gold. Right? And so it's a, what we call an extended network or a, a lattice or something like that. And the same thing with graphite. You know, these sheets just keep going on in two dimensions, x and y. And so there's no beginning, no end here. And the same thing with diamond, you know. Well, the, the smallest piece of diamond we can have is that cube right there. But the diamond just keeps going on and on. And so this is a lattice. And so the way we represent gold is we just represent gold like this, AU. For graphite, we just say carbon graphite, just a single. Here. For diamond, we say carbon, diamond. But there's one more form of carbon. Fullerene? Yeah, fullerene. Have you heard of that? Yeah. C60. C60, fullerene. Or Buckminster fullerene. So let's see if you got an image of that. Here. This is it here. You see D? Actually, these are other forms. D is a buckyball. It's like, like a soccer ball. It consists of 60 carbon atoms bonded together in a sphere like that. And so there, what we call this C60 to indicate that each of these have 60 carbon atoms. And so if, uh, the smallest unit of this would be a C60. We call this a, um, a molecule. versus a lattice. You see there's no molecule of gold, you know. Uh, it's, it's not a, a certain specific entity here. There's no molecule of graphite. There's no molecule. We could have a crystal and we could have any size crystal we want. But for C60, the only size we have is this. This is a buckyball. These are bucky tubes. These are other things as well. But the buckyball, which is the third one, C60, there's also C540, C70, but we won't talk about those. Third one. It's a molecule. And then um, we have something called amorphous or uh, glassy. 
you know, um, glasses, like window glass, they don't form crystals. If you take a hammer and break it, 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 it forms conchoidal fractures, you know, these kind of grand fractures. And in a lot of coal, we have um, glassy carbon. This is amorphous carbon here. This is a large sample of glassy carbon. All glassy means is that there's some disorder in the structure. You know, the structure got screwed up, and so it's not. This is kind of like um, diamond, kind of like graphite, and it's all screwed up, the bonds and everything else. It's still solid like this, so this would be a lattice structure of a glass. And so what, what does that look like as far as the atoms go? Um, show you. Crystalline structures, everything's so nicely ordered. In glass, there's some disorder. It's hard to see here, but maybe you can see it here. Do you see the contortions and the in the angles and stuff? Yeah. That leads to some disorder. This is um, silicon is the red and oxygen is the blue. This is what we call um, quartz glass. We have quartz glass versus quartz crystal. The difference between quartz glass and quartz crystal, quartz glass looks like this. It has some randomness to the structure. Quartz crystal. Quartz crystal has a very ordered structure, so you get these beautiful crystals like this. But um, you know, when you look at the internal structure of the quartz crystal, it's very well ordered. This is silicon in the center, and the oxygen is here. Here's more of it. But you can see everything's nicely arranged. This quartz crystal, very nice repeating pattern, versus quartz glass, which doesn't have this nice repeating pattern. So for quartz glass, you aren't going to get beautiful crystals like that. But the thing about quartz glass is you can shape it. You can shape it into whatever shape you want, which is nice. All right, um, I went too long. We're going to take a break here, and then um, we'll start again after the break. So let's take a 10-minute break.